fundamentally, we understand electrostatics of molecules from the point of view of uh, when a molecule is isolated, it has its ground state charge distribution. We that's all classical uh, electrostatics from the point of view of uh, the charge distribution produces a, a, a static field. The charge distribution, of course, is a quantum phenomenon, but once it's settled, uh, you have a classic electrostatic field. And uh, if another molecule or an ion or something comes in the neighborhood, the electric field of that second um, entity will polarize the and perturb the electronic structure. And uh, that means now you, it has to react and readjust. Uh, that's also quite well understood from the point of view of basic uh, physics and basic electrostatics. So these phenomenon, as long as you don't have a charge transfer, like when you have a very high valence ion that binds to something, very often they will share some of their electrons. It's like a semi-chemical kind of phenomenon. But other than that, most of the time, we understand the fundamental electrostatics. The problem is to develop a model that is both uh, practical for simulation, fast enough, and also that is um, accurate enough and has been parameterized and validated and calibrated to be as much as possible in agreement with either very high level ab initio uh, information or experimental information. And so at that point it becomes like a semi-engineering uh, task that we, we know what we're aiming for, we understand the principle, but now you just have to pull up your sleeves and actually do it. And it's, uh, it's a lot of work to do a, a polarizable model of only a single type of molecule. Let's say you want to do ethanol or you want to do water. It can be done, it's not so hard, but when you want to do a, a, a polarizable force seal for an entire uh, set of biomolecular moieties, you know, amino acid, nucleic acid, lipids, it gets to be a large effort because you want uh, this entire force field to be self-consistent. To be both, everything has to be accurate, but everything has to be sort of done with the same kind of ground rules so that everything is consistent. And so uh, it's not a particularly glorious task, but it is a daunting task to do this very well. And uh, in collaboration with Alex Macrell, University of Maryland, we've been working on one possible way of doing this force field, which is called uh, Parable for seal based on classical Drude oscillators. And uh, the basic physics of that uh, polarizable force field is pretty simple. Uh, on an atom, you have uh, at the nucleus, you attach a, a spring with a charge particle. And at rest, the charge particle rests on the nucleus. So that means there is no induced dipole. If you Im impose electric field, the, the dipole, the, the charge will move away from the nucleus, stretch a little bit the spring, and th that would cause an induced dipole. And so that is the basic structure of the Drude polarizable force field. Some people call it the charge on spring model, the COS, in fact. But it's a Drude, uh, the Drude polarizable force field. And, uh, Doing this for lipids, nucleic acid, proteins, uh, some basic solvents is something that we've been working on for the last four, five, six years. Programming it, uh, doing the, the proper test to make, uh, to make sure that the force field is actually uh, behaving correctly in, in uh, unexpected circumstances. And sometime along the way you do discover new, uh, new uh, facets I mean, uh, to this problem. For example, it seems likely that the polarizability of moieties that is reported experimentally is often measured in the gas phase. Let's say you'd say, oh, that molecule in the gas phase has a positive of that much. And then you can compute this with high level ab initio, try to match that value. But it would seem that when that molecule is actually transported into a dense medium, its polarizability actually is renormalized a bit smaller, a bit smaller than that, in part because you have overlap uh, uh, bumping into each other, so the electronic cloud of the molecule is uh, 
uh, is confined, and it, so the molecule has a smaller possibility. Um, and that seems to be uh, a general rule. We had not anticipated that when we started, but it seems that that's what you find in general. So the kind of experimental data that you need when you do a force field, for example, or if you want to, if you have an atomic model of a of a biomolecular system and you want to know, is this model good? Typically, on biomolecular systems themselves, you have only tentative data, very macroscopic, very indirect. Situation is too complex to use the biomolecular results or the experimental d data on biomolecular systems to tweak your model. That, that, is a, um, that is probably, in most general circumstances, that's a bad thing to do because the situation is too complex. So what you have to do is uh, step away from that and uh, go back to simpler situation like pure neat liquids. Uh, do you get the proper density, proper enthalpy? proper dielectric constant of pure s substances, you know, water, ethanol, benzene, uh, hydrocarbon chains, you know, act uh, alkanes, all this, this kind of stuff, acetamide, N methyl acetamide, formamide, so all these basic substances, you want to do them as well as possible. And uh, typically the data allows you then to really uh, calibrate the model to behave well. And uh, that general philosophy, in fact, is, is not something that we invented at all. This is, is, I would say, it goes back very much to what Bill Jorgensen was doing with OPLS in the early 80s. This was not a polarizable force field, but he was the first one, I think, to say, you have a model, and uh, from the point of view at, of atomistic interaction, it is not unreasonable. But whether that a particular interaction between two ethanols should be 6.3 kcal or 6.7 kcal, how can we know? Well, then you just run a simulation of a dense uh, system and then you tweak the model, you calibrate the model so that the enthalpy and density will be correct. And uh, the relationship between the microscopic property of a model and how it's going to actually uh, realize itself in a thermodynamic context, like a, you know, a, a dense liquid, is, is a bit unpredictable. You know, it's, uh, it's not something you can do with pencil and paper. You have to do a simulation. And since th the bottom line is that we want those models to perform well in a dense system context, where else should you calibrate them if not in the context of dense systems? So that's the general philosophy. This is sort of now buttressed by, uh, so at one end you have the thermodynamics, at the other end you could say, well now in 2012 we have access to high level ab initio that probably surpasses what Bill Jorgensen, for example, had access to in the early 80s. And so you can really make sure that we know the microscopic interaction between molecules with a level of accuracy that even gas phase experiments probably cannot uh, uh, match. So you use that data at one end to really anchor your system microscopically with a smallish error, some, some small uncertainty, and then you generate a family of models that are all consistent to this smallish error, and then you go to the thermodynamic. Typically the error will, will magnify there because uh, when you go to a dense system, you know, a half a kcal per mole of, of uncertainty between molecules for hydrogen bonding might end up being uh, maybe, you know, uh, 3 kcal of uncertainty on the enthalpy of the liquid. But then that you know very well experimentally. And so that allows you to say, oh, it's this family of models that are acceptable. Within that small uncertainty, we know the family of model. And then you have also another data, which is the density and the dietary constant. So it allows you to zoom in on a small subset of models that are giving you the correct macroscopic properties and are still within uh, the margin of uncertainty of the best possible ab initio. And so, so from, that point of, from that point of view, the model is not really predictive because uh, 
we can't really just run ab initio, generate a simulation of a dense model and know that we will have the enthalpy correctly. In general, there would be a considerable uncertainty if you were limiting yourself to that. But because you have access to the macroscopic thermodynamic va uh, values, it allows you to anchor the system at the other end. So you're anchored at both ends, microscopic and thermodynamic. And that's how the models are the best. To some extent, the electrostatics that comes out and that is realized in the non-parasable force field, we've pretty much have gone around the question by now. And so whether you use amber, charm, or OPLS, a non-polarizable force field, the charge distribution is essentially similar. There's not a, there's not a huge debate there. So there's not a lot of, of motivation to go back and redo that. The size of the Leonard Jones, the atomic radii, that's very sensitive. But once you've done your, your, your dense uh, basic substances, you know, uh, ethanol, benzene, liquid, deformamide, all that, you're basically done with that too. The place where there is the most uh, room for improvement, and there's still room for improvement in charm, OPLS, and amber, is, for example, on torsion potentials. Because, let's not forget, we do the elements, we do the moieties, we have good models, but then you link them together to make a polypeptide, you link a side chain to make an amino acid. And so, the parts were done as moieties, but they were never really talking together. Now, all of a sudden, they're linked together. And the torsions, the, the dihedral potential, are very sensitive to everything. They probably cannot be measured experimentally in most circumstances. So in that case, you definitely have to rely on high level ab initio to rescan. Uh, you have to, re that's my computer talking, uh, to rescan those dihedrals with very high level ab initio, something that was never done, uh, still actually has not been done. Uh, it's in the process of being done. And then you can uh, re-optimize the dihedral potential for chi-1, chi-2, phi, psi, etc., etc. In part, that's what Alex McRell did with Charlie Brooks with the C-map, which was a way to say, well, we know that the torsion, the dihedral potential, is the last resort. It's the, the, once you've done the, you know, once you've done the non-bonded and you've linked things together, the last place where the quantum mechanics that you can't account for is going to hide is in the torsion. And so that's the last place you should fix. Not the first, it's the last place you should fix. And if you have access to very high level ab initio, then you can try to do a better job. Now, obviously, if you have a, a polarizable force field, then you have to go back, redo the electrostatics, and rebuild everything from scratch. But if you're talking about a non-polarizable force field, it's not necessarily to go back to square one, but you can definitely work hard to re-optimize these, these dihedral potentials. Will we ever be able to correctly predict protein structures from first principle? I don't see why not. You know, we understand the fundamental uh, physics of the interactions that govern the folding of proteins. Uh, solvation, entropy, hydrogen bonding, van der Waal forces. This is all understood. There's nothing particularly uh, uh, mysterious about any of that. We all understand the basic. The only problem is to have enough sampling to search the conformational space efficiently. And uh, searching efficiently may not mean that you're running Newton's equation of motion with explicit solvent all the time, although maybe once you're close to the proper minimum, maybe that's better to do that. And uh, the other thing is to have a, a force field that's been uh, engineered to be accurate enough I believe that we don't need to have a perfect force field to predict structures because, you know, if you, if you have a, bi a biological protein and, uh, and, and a good protein that folds and you start to make mutants, it will still fold with the same structure. That means that proteins are very robust to small perturbation. And to some extent, you could see a bad force field is a kind of mutation, you know. And so as long as the force field is not awful, uh, 
I think we have a shot at solving the correct uh, structure anyway. So I, I, I am absolutely not pessimistic about that. Very often when you measure something, you obtain uh, the average of some observable, some property. Uh, in the case, for example, of membrane proteins, people do solid state and MR, and they measure uh, order parameters, they measure dipolar coupling, uh, they make measure, maybe they measure um, chemical shift and isotropy. So these membrane proteins would have like these samples that are oriented, they jiggle a bit, but they're oriented. And so these NMR properties, for example, will be averaged in solution, they would be average to nothing, but in the membrane, they might be average to some value. To convert that kind of information into a structure is often impossible from the point of view of, of math in the sense that it's not, there's not a unique answer. And uh, very, for a long time, solid state and MR spectroscopists have tried to invert their, their uh, measurement into a structure. In the best scenarios, they were able to when the protein is behaving like a piece of uh, solid, like a diamond almost. So there's some uh, early NMR, solid state NMR measurement on the, the orientation of the retinal in bacterial rhodopsin because they were extremely ordered and they did these measurements often at very small, uh, low temperature. And so they get angles, they would, but they can basically what, what is measured is the average, for example, of a second Legendre polynomial of a cosine, so P2 cos theta. And if there's the slightest fluctuation, you can't invert that function. If there is almost no fluctuation, then you just have P2 cos theta, and you can invert it and get the angle that corresponds to the value you measured. And so uh, when you start to do peptides and small proteins at room temperature in a membrane, you just can't invert it. And so you would like to utilize that information to deduce, to make the best, uh, um, the best use of the experimental information you have access to, but you don't want to bias that information with spurious, um, spurious uh, uh, deviation away from what the data is telling you. There's a mathematical formulation of that problem. It's, you say that when you run the simulation, for example, you would say this, like in Bayesian statistics, you'd say, I run my simulation with, with nothing else. That would be like the prior. That's like the prior. It's like your basic model. Your basic model may be not bad. I mean, the force field is good. The basic model is not bad. But it may not agree perfectly well with the solid state and MR measurement. Let's say you have 25 dipolar coupling, 50 uh, quadrupolar splitting, 15 uh, chemical shift and isotropy, what have you. You have lots of data like that. You would like to use that data to bias your model so that it reflects the best reality and agrees with the experimental data. But you don't want to bias the model in a way that is spurious. You want to bias it in a way that is the most faithful to both your model and your data. And so in the Bayesian sense, that's using the maximum entropy approach, where you, you will apply the maximum entropy. And what it gives you is a mathematical formula for how to bias the model in the best sense. And uh, and there's a way to do this, and so you can, you and you could buy, you could bias a liquid so that it obeys, you know, scattering function, neutron scattering or X-ray scattering on a liquid. You could bias um, uh, peptides in solution to to match cir circular dichroism or you know uh, Raman spectroscopy. So you could use a lot of experimental data to bias models in the least intrusive way, the most um, in a maximum entropy sense. Uh, this has not been done a lot. It's been done a little bit by uh, Chris Dobson and Robert Best. It's been done a bit by Juan Pil Im uh, from uh, University of, uh, of Kansas uh, on solid state and MR. Uh, Gerhard Hummer has done that a little bit on solution scattering. I think it's a business that's going to be growing. So ion channels 
are macromolecules that sit in membranes and they modulate and help control the passage of ion across the membrane. Most of the biological channels that are, have been studied are, uh, and are of high interest are very selective. So you have the potassium channel, are very selective for potassium over other ions, the sodium channel, the calcium channel, you have chloride channels. Um, th these systems are among the systems that can be studied with the, the highest level of scrutiny from an experimental point of view in biophysics. Uh, in part, it's because the membrane breaks the symmetry of space. So when you study an enzyme in solution, the entire thing is in solution. There's no left, right, above, below. So you're, you're a bit limited in what you can do to the system. When you study an ion channel, you have a membrane, you can impose different concentration across the membrane. You can impose different voltages. You can impose different pHs. You, and you can measure the current that goes across the membrane. That's a vectorial measurement. And so it gives you access to uh, a type of measurement that is remarkable compared to uh, soluble proteins. In addition, uh, you can use spectroscopic method to, uh, you can attach probe to the membrane protein or the ion channels to monitor its conformational change, for example. And so you can do, uh, you can attach uh, FRET or LRET probes to measure resonance energy transfer between donor acceptor. And you can do this and apply a voltage and then see that the, the conformation has changed. You can do this with EPR, with electron spin resonance. Um, you can do uh, polarized attenuated uh, uh, infrared uh, spectroscopy where you have membranes lying at the surface of a metal and then there's a, a um, standing wave that measures the, um, the uh, infrared vibration spectroscopy along the, as, a, as a function of distance uh, from the surface. And from that you can measure the orientation of different groups with respect to the membrane. Uh, and of course uh, before you can do computation on these structures, it's important to get high-resolution X-ray structures. Uh, 20 years ago, people were almost skeptical that you could crystallize so many membrane proteins. Uh, and in the late 80s, in fact, many people were beginning to think that only solid-state NMR or electron microscopy, cryomicroscopy, is going to be able to tackle membrane proteins. I would say the last decade has certainly proven that thing to be wrong that by and large X-ray crystallography has been extremely successful to determine the structure of membrane proteins. I think it's beyond the hopes of people. And uh, I would say probably around 1997, 98, 99, when Rob McKinnon got the KCSA uh, potassium channel, this X-ray structure of that, uh, Doug Reese got the mechanosensitive channels, that, that's around the time. I mean, Eric Guo got some glutamate receptor, but that was a soluble domain. But he got also the uh, alpha emolysin around the time. By now, Eric Guo has obtained actually the full length gl glutamate receptor. So that's like it gives you an example of how much progress there's been. But I think this around 98, 99 is when the, the paradigm started to shift and people said, maybe we can be successful getting crystals of membrane proteins. And they, they've been successful ever since, so we, now it's tremendous. Crystallography is always a mystery and it's always a bit of a miracle. So if somebody said that they are not surprised, well, I mean, you should not be so much more surprised that a membrane protein will crystallize than a, a soluble protein. After all, they're, they're both proteins. Um, I think what was missing was the amount of material. You know, before 99, people tried to crystallize uh, non-recombinant proteins. So they were trying to uh, put a horse through a blender, purify an acetylcholine receptor and try to crystallize it. And the problem is then you, you deal with glycosylation, you deal with a lot of variability. And uh, once you've purified your proteins, they're not they're a bit damaged already. The more you kick it around, the more you damage it, the more you disturb it. Uh, 
and the proteins were not really all in the same state, they did not crystallize. Once you start to be able to express this, uh, either in insect cells for eukaryotic proteins, but uh, uh, prokaryotic, you know, bacterial proteins, thermophiles are more stable than the normal proteins. So once you start to deal with that, I think what changed is that once people started to throw at this, thermophiles have a, a bigger amount of material, have access to a wider range of detergent, try more condition. Don't try to over overthink things, but just try more. You know, most proteins, people try hundreds of conditions and then they get a few crystals. And even once you zoom in on the correct conditions, you try to reproduce that and you often get only a fraction of the crystals growing under that same condition are really good diffraction quality for no understood reason. So it's just like trying more. I think it's mostly that people change their mind. You know, like in the 70s and 80s, the, the mindset of crystallography was that you ought to be able to understand why crystallize. You change the condition and you improve your crystal. After that, it was more like a kind of a shotgun approach. Say, let's not try to overthink this. Just try more condition. And then you can buy these plates with lots and lots of condition. And then you, you discover conditions where the crystal will grow. And so I think there's this, this been a paradigm shift. My, my general impression about biomolecular modeling is that even now with the models that are imperfect, our current models are imperfect, yet when you calculate some property and you come within a reasonable, you come reasonably close to the experimental value for some property, and you do this repeatedly. I mean, you can do this on several properties, or you compute the binding free energy of a ligand, and you get within, let's say, one kcal per mole of the experimental binding free energy. Well, one kcal is, is, is good, but it's not pharmacological precision in the sense that if you really wanted to fine tune drugs just based on that, one kcal is a little bit, it's still a little bit big. Nonetheless, when you calculate things at that level of precision, that means many of the elements in your simulation must have been pretty good, pretty accurate. And then my, my strongest perspective on this would be to say, even if your answer is not spot on, exactly like the experiment, if it's close enough, then it's a very strong indication that many of the elements in the simulation must have been quite good. And it's very worthwhile in analyzing those elements. How much uh, translational rotational entropy was entering in your calculation in order to be within 1 kcal. It could be that you find actually there was a 5 kcal. How much enthalpy entropy compensation? It could be you'll find, oh, there was a 20 kcal of enthalpy. You'll find lots of quantities that are not immediately accessible by experiment. But those quantities had to be correct, otherwise you would never have been, have been that close to the experiment. So I think sometimes people lose sight of, of this. They would say, oh, well, how do we believe your enthalpy is being 20 kcal? Well, how can you imagine that all these elements would conspire to give you roughly the right answer? Because you didn't do anything for these elements to conspire. They just came like that. And if you do this on several problems, and they repeatedly are in good agreement with the experiment, it is a strong indication that many, many things are quite all right in these simulation. And so I think the simulation are currently in a position to make very meaningful contribution to the understanding of these biomolecular systems. Even though they're not spot on and perfect, they are good enough to make very meaningful uh, contribution and get, provide very meaningful insight. Let's say there is a system, you compute a co several properties, they all agree with experiment. But then the art would be to go back and say, what element that gave rise to these properties are in agreement with experiment could also be measurable, perhaps, if somebody works hard enough. It may not be so easy. But are there some elements that are potentially measurable? And if you can, then 
to convince an experimentalist to measure those things, then that would confirm that you were really, really on the right track. You see? Sometimes what you measure and what you observe in simulation is not going to be very soon measurable. Because we can see a wealth of details are crazy. I mean, you can see metal groups rotating and, you know, hydrogens jiggling. If, if you can only talk about detail that could never possibly be measured, even in 200 years, to some extent it becomes a bit useless. Because we, these systems and these simulations still are craving for validation. And so it's important, it's still important, to identify elements from those simulations that you believe are correct because your properties were in agreement with experiments. So these elements must probably be correct, but to identify elements that could then be measured as well. That's what's, it's not so easy to identify. It's very easy to identify a detail that's fascinating, but to identify a detail that's fascinating and measurable is not so easy.